Thanks for coming at this uh, wonderful event. And I will start just by uh, thanking the uh, UN Employees Union to organize this event, to uh, everything they did for the space, uh, Facebook event, everything. So thank you very much to you. So for the one who told me, I'm Frédéric Nade, I'm a newcomer, of course. Not two years yet, but still. <laughs> when I come back from a trip to see my family, it's always feels like home here, so. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So, I'm really glad that we can have Libby Davies here. Um, I had the uh, great opportunity to work with her in Ottawa when I was there, and it was a wonderful experience, and I think I'm speaking probably on behalf of everyone when I say it's kind of a scary thought of thinking of apartments without her, but <laughs> we'll have to get used to it. But, so, just to introduce a little bit of Libby, uh, we have a biography from our website here. So, first elected member of parliament for Vancouver East in, in 1997, so it's been a long time. She's been re-elected in 2000, 2004, 2006, 2008, and 2011. She was the uh, official position critics for health, the vice chair of the standing committee on health, and, uh, well, from May 2011 until January 2015. Uh, she's also the uh, deputy leader of the NDP, and she used to be the NDP house leader. She's also the co-chair of the HIV AIDS Tuberculosis uh, Caucus, and the chair of the Interparliamentary Union's advisory group on HIV AIDS and maternal, maternal and child health. She has a background in activism in Vancouver. She's been for more than 35 years. She was elected to five consecutive terms uh, as a municipal uh, councillor. And she did you, you didn't years. know that we know that much about you, did you? <laughs> more than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> and she also worked for the uh, Hospital Employees Union uh, between 1994 and 1997. So I think there's a lot of things we could say. She received a lot of prize in her career, <laughs> really a great career that she had in politics. And I mean, I saw her uh, going at work at the health committee in Ottawa, and she was always working on it, trying to find results, which is not always easy when you have a conservative majority in front of you. Uh, they wanted certain issues, and whatever it takes, they find. Yeah, that's the way it was going. And yeah, and her last bill in Parliament that was debated was about uh, sodium reduction in food. So I think elk is really an issue that she can speak about, that she knows about, and I can't wait to hear you. So maybe the floor is to you. Thank you so much for your great. First of all, it's great to be here, and thank you very much to the Yukon. Um, Government Employees Union for hosting us and providing the space. It's a great room. And thank you for coming out on your lunch hour because I'm sure you probably were well, taking a walk or catching up on email or having lunch with friends. So thank you for being here. I'm not going to talk too long. I really want us to have a discussion um, about healthcare issues that you're facing in Yukon, uh, what's going on federally. Um, but I think it would maybe help if I just kind of gave a little bit of a federal context. And as Frederick pointed out, I was a healthcare critic for quite a few years. And um, uh, Frederick actually worked for one of my colleagues, uh, Joita Sella, who was um, the deputy health critic for the um, NDP. And he used to go to this health committee. Um, I don't know, Liz, what your standing committees are like. We here. don't have them. Oh, you don't have them? Well, we have them, but There's so no they need them. And honest to God, um, you know, there, there were such critical issues in healthcare, and of course what the, what the government members would do, they would study th things that weren't unimportant, you know, but they really weren't critical issues. And so Frederick is right, we would battle it out, and we had a terrible chair. Um, and we would, oh gosh, it was, we would go twice a week and we just kind of wring our hands and think, how are we going to deal with this today? Um, there was three of us on the committee, so it was, uh, it was quite the experience being on the health committee in Ottawa. Um, but I, I guess what I want to say is that, you know, we obviously had our parliamentary work and we'd be raising things in question here. But what we did um, as the NDP, as the official opposition, is that we decided 
that what we absolutely have to do is that we have to we have to go out and talk to Canadians about our public health care system. And um, when I started doing that in it was just a few years ago, 2012, we launched sort of a campaign, and we were really um, concerned to do this because we've been watching Stephen Harper basically completely move up healthcare. I mean, there's always been a federal, provincial, territorial relationship around healthcare. Of course, the money's a big deal for the transfers, but there's always been negotiation around transfers. There's always been some understanding of commonalities that we're facing and what we need to do. And of course, what we've seen with uh, this particular federal government is that they've, they've really totally backed up healthcare. I mean, they basically said, it's not our issue, it's not our problem. And so we were, everybody was shocked. The premiers were shocked <laughs> when the federal government, it was Jim Flaherty, basically made a unilateral decision about healthcare funding in, I think it was 2012, it was right at the end of the year, um, and made this unilateral decision. And we knew that the health courts were gonna end in 2014. And to be honest, the health accords that had been signed in 2004 were never that great. You know, they weren't perfect. They, there were really very few strings attached, but it was at least a document that came out of a process with the federal government, the provinces, and the territories for a 10-year agreement on health care. And they did set certain goals, um, which they really didn't do a very good job of meeting. Um, but at least there was something on paper. And so what we've seen in Ottawa, Ottawa now is this um, pattern of disengagement, um, of unilateralism, and basically saying, we don't care what you do. Now, we all understand that health care is a, the delivery of health care, the provision of health care services is a provincial and territorial service. I mean, we, we all get that. But there's always been a federal role. And of course, the federal government itself is the fifth largest provider of health care in Canada in terms of um, First Nations, in terms of veterans, um, military, and so on. Um, so it, it itself is a provider of health care services. Um, so when we embarked on our uh, uh, process, of talking to Canadians, we really felt like there was a vacuum that was being created in healthcare. Um, well, on the one hand, we had Harper, who was just totally disengaging. On the other hand, we had the health accords that we knew were coming to an end, and it looked like there was no sign in sight of any sort of renewal of the health accords, even though many organizations, whether it was the Canadian Medical Association or the uh, Canadian Nurses Association, many other groups were saying, Canadian Health Coalition, uh, that we have to renew the health accords. And then there was a third thing that's happening, which I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to hear how much you've been facing this in Yukon, and that is privatization. So, you know, you have this sort of political environment, and it's really been setting the stage for increasing pressure of the privatization. And of course, we know that healthcare is a multi-billion dollar industry in this country. And there's a lot of money to be made from healthcare. We see what goes on in the United States, um, where it's, you know, it's basically a privatized system. And so with this sort of vacuum, we could see the pressures of privatization and, and, and politically the stage being set for that, right? As the system begins to break down and fail, then it's really easy for the Brian Days of the world uh, who's a, a guy from BC, is, is now a court case which you might be familiar with in BC, around privatization to say, hey look, the system doesn't work and we, you know, we can come in and we can do a better job, we can create private services, you just gotta pay a little bit, a lot, um, and we're gonna create a better system. So the whole threat of privatization which undermines the public system. So when we went out across the country, um, we had um, a number of town hall meetings um, and they were all uh, quite well attended. We didn't come to Yukon. Uh, there was a limited number that we were able to do. But I think what was more important is that we held a number of key stakeholder meetings in Ottawa. Uh, and we gathered together um, healthcare providers, professionals, advocates, and we actually sat down and talked with people. And so we had very intense discussions on things like continuing care. So uh, home care, long-term care, palliative care. Uh, we had discussions on primary care. 
Uh, we had um, special sessions on the social determinants of, of health. We had sessions on um, Aboriginal health care. We had sessions on midwifery. Uh, we had sessions on, um, um, uh, gosh, what was the other one that we did? Uh, oh, Pharmacare, <coughs> that's a big one. Pharmacare, drug coverage. Uh, we actually did that one in Vancouver. Um, and, and when we did these consultations, we actually sent out a questionnaire to um, a whole number of groups who, who you know, were involved in that field, and we got a lot of input from them before we even got to the meeting. Um, and really it was to have a consultation about where we needed to go. Uh, and the premise that we were operating from is that our public health care system in Canada is very sound. It is, it is hugely supported by the public, but it's also a huge concern for people in terms of wait times, in terms of lack of access to primary care. Um, and so there's no question that we need to strengthen and expand our public health care system. So that's, that's, you know, for us, it was never a question of, of privatization being on the table and saying that somehow we've got to have a two-tier system. It was always from the premise of we have a solid system that goes way back to when Tommy Douglas started um, Medicare in Saskatchewan and the battle that he had. And the premise was how do we actually improve and, and, and support this public health care system. And the information we got back was truly um, incredible. And in fact, I, I brought a few of the documents. I, I just, I'm sorry I didn't bring enough. Um, yeah, it's right there. <coughs> and what we did was, um, Based on what we heard and the discussions we had, we kind of put it back to people. Um, and the, the leader of the NDP, Tom Mulcair, was very involved in this process too. And so in a, this really is kind of our blueprint of where we think we need to go on healthcare. And first and foremost, it deals with the federal role because that's how we have to come at it because we are, you know, I'm a federal MP and that's our, that's our, our, our view of how things, um, uh, that's our perspective. Um, so, so some of the document talks about uh, very basic questions like the, the absolute need for federal leadership in healthcare. Like the federal government has to be at the table. There have to be new health accords. Um, we're very concerned that the funding that was announced in the longer term will shortchange the provinces and the territories by $36 billion. So we're talking about a lot of money that's going to disappear out of the system. Uh, this is not an analysis done by us. It's an analysis that's done by the Parliamentary uh, Budgetary Office and also by the premiers themselves because they've been very worried about health care as well. Um, so, so that's sort of one um, major <coughs> inclusion is just the federal role. Um, I can't tell you as health critic how many times I have received um, delegations and met with people who say we need a federal strategy on whether it's rare diseases, diabetes, um, uh, seniors, um, this, you know, what, like it's just like this long list. And it, it just spoke volumes to me that there's a great uh, yearning from people that people understand that operating in your own jurisdiction, of course, is very important. And we're not talking about kind of a one size fits all. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about collaboration. We're talking about best practices. We're talking about trying to set some standards for care in Canada. So for example, one of the things that we did was introduce a bill in the House of Commons on continuing care. And we kind of laid out, I didn't bring the bill with me unfortunately, um, but you can, I, I think it's on my website, but we kind of laid out the principles of continuing care, and I know that's been an issue here in White Horse in terms of long-term care facilities. Um, you know, it's a huge patchwork across the country. Um, some places there's very little home care, other places there is home care. Other places there's long-term care, but it's all privatized. Uh, and, the, and the quality standards are, you know, a bit iffy. Um, and so it's not that we want to see a one-size-fits-all. It's really more a matter of saying that under the Canada Health Act, uh, which is federal legislation, Canadians rightly have an expectation that the accessibility um, of their health care system and the quality of their health care system um, should be you know, within sort of a, 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 a common framework, within a general ballpark. Um, <coughs> for example, it's very disturbing to know that if you're a cancer patient in New Brunswick, 
and you're using very, very expensive drugs, as we know they are, that what they actually recommend to you is that you move to BC, wait the six months uh, until you become a resident of BC, and then you can apply under the BC Pharmacare program to get coverage for these um, very expensive drugs. I mean, uh, wow, this is a response to someone's critical health care need. It's just illogical. Um, so, so the document does focus on the federal role, and then it goes into particular issues, and I'm, I'm sure there are issues that you're probably grappling with here, and I would say that the way we framed it is that um, we, we definitely believe that the system should be um, more sensitive and more accessible to um, health promotion and disease prevention. I mean, this is something we all know. And, and what I would say in meeting, uh, I mean, I've met with hundreds of groups. There is an incredible consensus in Canada about what needs to be done. Like, it's, it's remarkable. Like, everybody's pretty well saying the same thing. The problem has been the lack of the political kind of leadership and mechanism to help bring it about. So, for example, the document will talk about the importance of primary care. Um, we, we are very supportive of the idea of community-based community health centers that have, um, you know, community involvement and governance involved, that they're multidisciplinary, that they're based on health promotion and disease prevention. Um, so that's, that's one sort of thing we deal with. And some of the other big ones I've already mentioned, pharmacare, we want to see a universal national pharmacare program. Home care, this is something that Roy Romano actually recommended in the Royal Commission that he did in 2002. He said it was an urgent need in Canada. Well, now it's 2015 and we have no such program. It was actually identified in the Health Accords of 2004 as one of the priorities that the, uh, the provinces and the territories would address. Well, they didn't. Um, does anybody see a national home care program? Um, I haven't seen it. Um, and then the other one that was identified was um, to work on drug coverage. Um, so these are some of the big issues that we identify. Um, certainly things like mental health. We heard um, a lot more about mental health than I think we've ever heard before. And it is, I think, a much more invigorated uh, debate. Um, you know, it, for those of you who are involved in healthcare, you, you know that it was sort of, you know, the kind of subject that didn't get talked about. And it was sort of like, well, those people over there, something like that. And, and it, that, I believe that's changed. And in fact, if I had to, if I'm really, really pushed to name one good thing that the federal government did, it was to set up the Mental Health Commission of Canada, uh, which has focused on sort of a national approach to mental health. Um, and we hope that they will be able to continue their work in, in the coming years. Um, so things like primary care, home care, national drug, drug coverage, um, focusing on the social determinants of health, um, uh, uh, better access to doctors, decreasing wait times. I mean, these are these are the issues that people brought to us and that we we discussed. And so these are the issues that are in the document. And so um, I, I sort of just want to open up with that kind of context um, because I think sometimes people are you know they're not maybe fully aware of how this sort of needs to work together, how it needs to be collaborative, um, and that without the federal government there. It's really hard. And so one message that we've had to the premiers, uh, because I, I would always go to the meetings, um, you know, they have these, uh, what do they call it? The, um, they call it the something council. It's, it's basically with the, what is it? Council Federation. Council Federation, thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Liz. I mean, they, would have, they have these annual meetings, and they always have, some of them have been totally focused on healthcare. Uh, and the last couple of ones they've had, they've at least they've had a working group on healthcare, um, and and they've been sort of taking the view that um, um, you know the federal government's really not there. Maybe they'll kind of help a little bit on this or a little bit on that. Um, but basically, we have to get on without without them. And and I've noticed that a lot of the national organizations have then adopted the same kind of thing. Now I understand. Sort of the pragmatic reality of doing that, like you got to go where the action might be happening and try and influence what's going on. So politically, I certainly understand that, but we've also been saying <coughs> um, to the provinces and the territories and also to 
um, some of the national uh, key organizations, don't let the feds off the hook. Like this, you know, this is a, a, a critical issue under the Canada Health Act. It's a critical issue for Canadians. And so I do hope um, that in the upcoming federal election that this actually will be an issue, the federal role in healthcare and the state of our healthcare system from the point of view of not sort of doing it in, but from the point of view of strengthening our healthcare system. Because I, I, I really believe that for most Canadians, it's about healthcare, but it's actually about something more. And I think this is what the federal government doesn't get. It's actually about, a, it's part of Canadian history and values of what kind of society that we live in. Um, and, and we see ourselves very differently from um, a, a society, in the, for example, in the US, where there's a completely different uh, frame and perspective, uh, by and large, uh, on, on healthcare. And so it, it's more than healthcare. It's actually about a Canadian value that I think is, is touches people and is very important. So we, we hope to make it a, a key issue. Um, and I hope that this document will say to people that we're not just about um, you know talking about it, but we actually have some very concrete ideas about how to move forward, about how to improve things, uh, and that people can respond to that. Now, it's not perfect. I've already had feedback on some stuff, and that's great, because that's why it's out there. Um, and that's what I hope that we might hear today. Um, uh, but, but it's there, at least it's something concrete to respond to. So I think maybe I will um, end there, and I would love to um, just hear from any of you about sort of what's, what's the situation here, what issues there are in terms of health care, um, and how you see that um, relating to sort of the federal responsibility. Um, you know, there may be some issues that you've worked on that have come up. I, I mean, for example, one of the, um, I think, things that's sort of quite hot right now is that there's a big call for a senior strategy. I mean, the Canadian Medical Association has done a lot of polling. Um, they, they might have actually done it with the nurses. I think they did, yeah. And they, um, at their, their um, convention last summer, they released it. And, you know, there's no question that people are worried about aging. People are worried about, you know, the so-called sandwich generation. They're worried about their aging parents and they're also worried about themselves and what's going to happen. So, and, and there's really, you know, there, as I say, there might be some stuff going on in different jurisdictions in Canada, but there's no overall direction about what we need to do. And, uh, and that, you know, that's something that I, I think we just can't tolerate. So, I, I, I've been told that, um, I remember one witness at the health committee who said, you know, Canada is a country of pilot projects. Yeah. You know, like we hear all of these amazing things that are going on, but they're either pilot projects or they're kind of like just in that one place, right? And so, I mean, we are a big country, that's for sure, but it's, uh, oh, it's, uh, it is really, yes. is that snow or rain? No. Sleet, hail. Hail, okay. Well, we did have hail in BC, so I'm sorry if I brought it with me. It's an improvement from snow. Every week at our convention, it's too hot and too sunny, so this is okay. Okay. <laughs> I should I be at the convention when it was a beautiful Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. It's easier to take. Okay, so. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop there. So um, please jump in, and we want to make this informal and um, whatever you'd like to say. Yeah, Pat. Hi, Libby. Um, I know one of the concerns, big concern um, about the public health system right now is the the uh, bulging demographic of these more senior cohorts be included <clears throat> and what that will do given the way our model is right now in public health and how costly that was going to be. And I'm very, very my thinking is that we need a new model, not what that's looking at public health. And I really like these community, the concept of community-based, multidisciplinary um, health centers. Yeah. Where we can, where, and to me this could be such that it could address issues of seniors as well. But, but overall, um, rather than the doctor knows best and go to the doctor's office, this is more of a collaborative, team-based delivery of health care. And I'm just wondering if any costing has been done to look at how that would cost compared to our current model. 
Um, I'm not aware specifically <coughs> of any custody, but the one organization that was meant <coughs> to kind of track the um, the commitments that were made in the Health Accord from 2004, because they, they made five um, commitments, um, and they were to track them. And that was the Health Council of Canada, and it, it too got abolished in uh, just a, a month or so before the health courts. So, so the one kind of national body that we had that did a lot of analysis has gone. Now there are still obviously like Kai Hai and some of the health in, health research institutes obviously do some work, but I, I really don't know how accessible that is. Um, and when I've been working with the, um, I forget the exact name of it, but it's like the National Association of Community Health Centers across the country. Um, and I've been, I've been actually saying to them, like, do you guys have numbers? Like, in, you know, like, I believe instinctively, you know, from experience that community health centers uh, are work, you know, that, that's, where they, that's where it should be, close to you in your local community. It should be multidisciplinary. It should be based on outreach uh, proposals. It should be based on, you know, targeting a key populations that are vulnerable and all of that stuff. But I, but again, I don't know that they've actually got the hard data that, that shows the evidence. So it's something maybe that we need to do. Because I'm thinking without num, yeah, I the, in, by concept, and I know <clears throat> sort of pilot projects that, that are happening. But I just my gut instinct says this is the way should we, we should be going. And definitely everything we talked about the outreach, yeah. looking at wellness. I mean, promoting yeah. wellness, not just. I'm, I'm going to throw in a curve. Um, you know, I went to um, a day-long session in Toronto recently with a guy called um, George Lakoff. Has anybody ever heard? Okay. Now, he is a cognitive linguist. Um, he's an academic uh, guy at Berkeley. He must be in his 70s now. He's written tons of books. <coughs> and he's the guy who um, basically has done all of this analysis about um, framing. Like, I mean, this is getting a bit political, and I hope it's OK. But like, why, why are the conservatives in the United States so successful at what they do? Like, how do they win people over? And he's analyzed this and analyzed this. And then, so he, and I can't go into all that he's done, but you might want to um, take a look at it. But the, the thing that stuck with me is that he says that what conservatives do very successfully is that they really um, frame issues and they speak to people based on people's feelings and emotions. What we do, and when I say we, I mean generally progressives, we base our stuff on logic, evidence, fact, rationale, and we expect, every, you know, like, well, don't you get that? Right, and 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 we can't understand why people don't get it, and it, and so I, I say I sort of throw a bit of a curve because I think we often think that you know to kind of win the day on whatever issue, all we got to do is come up with some more evidence, right? Put the numbers in, and I agree, you have to do that. I mean, you actually do have to. I mean, I, I do believe that, but I, I really learned a lot from this session about how we're missing like a whole kind of consciousness about how we work and how we frame issues. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's very, and, and maybe that's like, that's part of the debate on healthcare and why privatization, you know, it has traction, right? It, it, like, it, it, it seems like a contradiction that on the one hand, Canadians overwhelmingly support public healthcare but on the other hand, privatization has traction. And in fact, he gave a very good example. Um, when when uh, Obama introduced the, um, uh, the, the National um, um, Healthcare Affordability Act, quite a mouthful, they did a whole bunch of polling. And, and it, was, um, it, it, it had very strong public support. Because A, you can't really attack healthcare. And B, you know, people obviously want something more affordable. And so what this guy Lakoff said was that the conservatives understood that. So what they did was they renamed it to Obamacare. Yes. And, and, and by, by that shift, 
that reframing of the debate, they made it about Obama, you know, like how people felt about him and what he was doing. And it became a very different debate. And you've seen that. You've Absolutely. actually seen that in the media. Nobody calls it the National Healthcare Affordability Act, or whatever the heck it's called. It's actually longer than that. It's got like this long <laughs> name, right? Nobody calls it that. Everybody calls it Obamacare. And, it, and it, as you know, it's become really divisive, right? You either hate it, or you, and, you, and, it, and it's going to destroy you know, freedom and liberty or whatever yeah. else. I don't know. Or people think no, right? But that's what they did. They framed it. So it's, it's quite fascinating. I feel like we need to work more with psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look at all the yeah. federal bills, they're all named those sweet names, you know, oh, the federal bills, thank you. Yeah. These bills, yeah. We just had one in Ottawa, oh my god. It was called <clears throat> Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices. Okay. Oh. I kid you not. What, and what's the what? Well, Which bill it's complicated. That? It's a horrible bill that supposedly, you know, um, speaks to um, not allowing um, marriages where the per you know, a woman is uh, uh, underage and, and a whole bunch of other things like honor killings. But all of these things are already illegal in Canada. <coughs> but what they, so this is actually a great example. What they did, and they've done it with a lot of their crime bills, they, they basically kind of scoop it up, they package it, frame it, Yeah. yeah, I was just going to follow up to Pam because, it, I mean, one of the agreements for, in the, the accord, which came to an end in 2014, was that, I can't remember what the percentage was, but it was a big percentage, it was 75 or 90 percent of Canadians will have access to uh, multi-professional team care, and which that has absolutely not happened. But I think there is some research, and that was Pam's name on BC Hall, health economist, is up here. Uh, uh, we spoke to us. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I think he's done some work on that. So I think yeah. there are yeah. pockets of research yeah. that's been done, and McMaster are doing some right now. Yeah. Other practitioners actually, because people are saying, is it cost efficient? So yeah. they're and they're, they're not having to start to, to prove it is or isn't. You have to look for it. You do have to. Look. The thing is, it's true. You know, <coughs> get it. The, the general public get it. They keep saying, why are we not um, investing in health promotion in this direction? And I mean, we saw. Royal Mill here and he keeps the hairdress at the time. But the thing is, the Canadians do get that, and that is what they want. But yeah. somewhere other, they're not. Uh, are, are, there, are there community health centres in mm -hmm. White Well, there's two. There's two. What well, the point of that? And are they, but are they for um, like key populations, or are they open to the general public? The one on the death note, I don't know if it's a Technically, it's all in the death note. It's First Nation, and then the Tiger. Clinic, which is really somewhat targeted to people who um, have multiple complex health yeah. issues. Because I, I mean, I, I've been very interested in the whole concept of community health centers, and it varies hugely. Like Ontario seems to have um, a very well established yes. model of truly neighborhood community based um, community health centers. Like, I, of course, I live in Ottawa quite the time, and I live just two blocks from what's called the Sunset. Community health center. I've gone there. I've actually never seen the doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've gone there for little bits and pieces, whatever, and nothing. I never saw the doctor. I only ever saw the nurse practitioner. And and they didn't ask me, you know, who I was. Well, I mean, they did ask me who I was, but I, mean, I had to fill stuff out. But but it wasn't like I had to be part of a, a, a key population. Uh, and I, I 